Welcome, everybody. I have a very special guest this morning on our Freedom Lovers Life podcast. He is Alex Voss from Tipolis. And Alex, you know, before I go into what you do and who you are, why don't I let you do that? You're, you're better at it than me. So go ahead. <laughs> let, let everybody know what, what, what you guys are up to and who you are. Awesome. Thanks very much, Patrick. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Alex Voss. I am here, uh, I think, because I'm pretty much involved in in a number of different things uh, freedom lovers might be interested in. Uh, just to name a couple of them and really the key ones, um, two things. One, I'm uh, uh, affiliated with uh, and a board member of the Free Cities Foundation, which is an organization. It's a, a nonprofit in the U.S. that is looking to achieve a 501c3 status shortly. Uh, and we are in the business of promoting uh, small jurisdictions that uh, are making an effort to uh, do uh, implement policy changes uh, that, that encourage human flourishing and human freedom. Um, on the other hand, I'm also the CFO and a board member of Tipolis, which is a Singapore uh, corporation. And that company is actually in the business of uh, negotiating, uh, establishing, developing, owning, and operating these free private cities or free cities. Uh, we call them international cities. It's sort of our brand. Uh, and I'm sure throughout the course of this conversation, we'll get into a bit more discussion about what exactly are these uh, free cities or international cities. But I'm um, you know, involved with two organizations. One, the foundation, as I mentioned, more on the uh, educational side, and then Tipolis on the actual uh, practical implementation side of these sorts of projects. And as everybody can imagine, Alex and I kind of got to know each other, I guess, a couple of years ago now, um, both being in the kind of space of looking to create freedom-oriented communities and uh, kind of autonomous um, communities, in, in Alex's case, more like the full cities. Ours are more the residential size communities like uh, our Veritas Village group. Um, and so we have a lot of things in common. Uh, I've been working in Latin America for a couple decades, so got to know a number of people down here. And, and so Alex and I have you know, talked about and, and have made several trips together to different countries to, to talk to their leaders or people high up in their government about creating an international city in their country, kind of like a Singapore, I guess you could relate it to, or like the Dubai International Free Zone, uh, what do they call it, the DIFC? Yeah, Financial Center, yep. Financial Center. And, uh, you know, that obviously that can bring an awful lot of investment into countries like the ones here in Latin America that, that we love. And so we're, we're kind of creating these Veritas Village freedom and self-sustainability oriented communities. But, the you know, that and looking to you guys, actually, at Tipolis to, you know, help us with the governance, the HOAs and those sorts of things within those communities, because we we feel like we're the experts in creating these amazing communities, but we're not necessarily experts in governance types of things in, inside a community, although we are doing some pretty cool things with DAOs and stuff like that. But maybe you can explain a little bit about what an international city would be. Sure. Or is. Yeah, so um, it, it is a bit hard to to understand conceptually since it's really at the forefront uh, of innovation in what we like to call the market for living together. Um, what these are, so so Patrick and and his company is very much in the business of building freedom communities, but I would call it freedom in a more de facto. Uh, circumstance. It's choosing to move with people that are like-minded. It's particularly emphasizing certain aspects. Uh, you know, low uh, low radiation, low low uh, emissions, these sorts of things, or rather, uh, you know, just sort of off grid and less susceptible to um, you know the the state utilities that were typically given. Tipolis uh, certainly encourages and, and appreciates all of that, and we will need to incorporate that in some of our projects, but it's much more focused on legal autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis or relative to a host nation. We're somewhat less, uh, you know, I used to say we're industry, uh, sorry, country agnostic. I don't think that's quite true, but more country agnostic than, than maybe a, a typical uh, community developer. We are very interested in talking with a host nation in order to achieve uh, essentially 
uh, the ability to govern and regulate affairs almost completely within the zone. We still want to remain under the sovereignty and under the jurisdiction of a host nation. They provide uh, national defense. They provide international relations. Uh, they even provide us, in some sense, legitimacy uh, so that we're recognized by other jurisdictions, not necessarily as our own jurisdiction, but uh, if we just declared independence, the rest of the world wouldn't recognize you know, our little community. And so we are actually working hand in glove with a host nation to get that autonomy. We're talking about autonomy, you know, in internal affairs. So we have our own police. We have independent uh, dispute resolution. Sometimes that's uh, that's a bit of a tricky one, um, but we like to have independent dispute resolution. We're talking about our own regulations. We're talking about uh, totally privately financed uh, infrastructure, uh, energy, all of these sorts of things, so that we are as um, we come as a as a package of significant investment, but also it makes us robust against uh, attacks for people that want to live that that free life. So uh, we did mention Singapore and Dubai. I would just add to that. You might think of uh, Hong Kong maybe a couple decades ago as similar to this. In fact, international cities are often set up as special administrative regions. So in some sense, the one country, one country, uh, sorry, two, uh, one country, two systems sort of policy. Um, and so that's that's like another way you might think about, it. of course, Hong Kong is, is managed publicly, it's just another government, but its relationship relative to mainland China is something similar to what we're looking to establish in the places that we go. Yeah, it's interesting, like, we're obviously, I'm, I'm here in Panama while we're doing this right now. And, and you know, this is a a civil law country, as most of the Latin American countries are, um, in fact, all except Belize. Um, but, but uh, you know, if someone wanted to come into the international city that you developed, like you said, a kind of two, two systems within one country, they could potentially bring like common law with them and, and set up their business, for instance, under, under a law that's proven somewhere in the world. Yeah, that's right. And you know, it's interesting. I think there's a fair amount of debates. I personally am a big fan of the common law, although I'm told by the the, the legal uh, experts in our company that more or less common and civil law get to a very similar place, at least they have uh, in our world today. Nonetheless, um, regardless of whether or not they get to a similar place, common law is really looked at in the finance community in particular as um much superior for doing financial transactions. So, you know, for example, um, you know, one small little uh, tweak in common law. There's um, the ability you cannot uh, you cannot cr um, what they call um, creating a high a hierarchy of uh, sorry borrowing against moving inventory. So if you have uh, if it's not a fixed if it's a fixed asset in civil law, you can borrow against it as a secured loan. If it's moving assets, meaning I'm just going to secure all of my inventory and I have some going out and some coming in each day, but as a bucket, I'm using this this uh, this inventory as collateral. That's not really possible in civil law countries the same way it is in common law countries. And what this means is that that lenders can't what they call perfect their their interests right. which means that they charge slightly higher rates and so i mean it's a very very small and unique thing and yet it has quite literally hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of impact on where uh, supply chains go and and where uh, where businesses look to establish themselves so typically we are interested in moving uh, towards a common law system it's very difficult in some places and less so in others but uh, in general, common law is slightly superior and, and what we look to establish in these international cities. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things I like about civil law, and it's not specifically tied to the law, but in the, most of the Latin American countries that you know, took their law from Spain and made the, uh, themselves under civil law, they don't tax foreign income, which you know, I, I don't know of any common law countries that like I'm from Canada, if I made money in the U.S., I'm still getting taxed on that. You know, if I'm in, if I'm a Canadian resident, and likewise in the U.S. or most countries, I think. I mean, that's one of the things I really loved about Latin America. And we moved down here, and still, 
make earning money that was coming from outside of the countries down here and, and not getting tax on it. So, you know, it'd be nice to have some kind of combination of these of these laws. I mean, you have the stability, I guess, of of common law from from, you know, British Empire times. And and then you have, you know, some very unique kinds of things in, in civil law that were that are kind of cool, too. But like you said, if you can't for finance companies, I can see where that, you know, you, you certainly want to pick the right type of law for, you know, if you can't perfect your 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 assets, your loans, then then that's that's a big change for them. But I guess you you refer to these also as kind of special economic zones, right? Yeah. Like we, I, I kind of look at our Veritas village communities as special lifestyle zones. So a, a, SL SLZ, I guess, so the <laughs> SEC. But so maybe describe a little bit what you know, because there, there's a, definitely a focus on economics in in your international cities, right? You want to attract you know lots of business people, but then you also have obviously people need to live and be entertained, and I think. The Dubai International Financial Center was one of the, you know, cool ones to look at as an example of that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly um, special economic zones uh, have started. I, I'll tell the story about special zones in just a minute, but I think it's helpful just to take a step back and think about, you know, international city sounds like a very ambitious idea, and it is. I don't mean to downplay that. However, it's much more evolutionary than revolutionary, I would argue. It's really a trend that we've seen, not so much that uh, international cities are being started, but all of the assets, all of the focus of what international cities are about have been increasing across time. And so how that really manifests is special special zones in their modern uh, in their modern heyday started in China, uh, really in Shenzhen and a few other areas. and the zones really started as sort of import export, uh, try to make it easier for people to move goods across borders, maybe make the customs regime slightly easier, or the taxes slightly lower, those sorts of things. Uh, from then, it, it sort of naturally evolved into having a, a bit more manufacturing, sort of light manufacturing, and then exporting something or importing it, doing the manufacturing, and then re-exporting it or importing it into the country, however you want to look at it. Of course, then from there, we got a bit more complex manufacturing. But the question was about two decades ago, maybe in the early 2000s, do zones apply at all to services industries? Or is it just for physical you know, manufacturing and industrial? And of course, many people were on both sides of that argument. Dubai took a rather radical approach at the time and decided we're going to give it a shot. We want to introduce financial services to Dubai. So we're going to establish the Dubai International Financial Center. Of course, that's been a wild success uh, and it's been replicated many times. What's interesting is that services doesn't appear to be the end of the line in terms of the evolution of special zones. It's probably the phase that we are most uh, that we're sort of most dominantly in at the moment, but it doesn't appear to be where the future is. The future, we think, is what's happened to DIFC over the past 20 years and really sort of how it's how it's falling out about now. And that is that the DIFC was so successful. It was bringing business people from all over the globe, from Singapore, from London, from the U.S. to do business uh, in Dubai. And so the zone is thinking, well, all these people are flying in. They're doing all their business in the DIFC, which, by the way, is one square kilometer, very tiny piece of, of land. Uh, they're doing all their business here, and then they go out to the rest of Dubai, and they go to the nightclubs, or they go to the coffee uh, shops, the restaurants, the hotels, you know, all the other aspects of what it means. They, they live, uh, if they're going there for multiple months, they rent apartments outside the zone, all these sorts of things. So effectively, every aspect of what it means to be a human, except for the work piece, was done outside the DIFC. And so the DIFC is thinking, well, we're the ones bringing everyone here and we're not capturing enough of the value chain that's being created. Why don't we put in some apartments in DIFC? Why don't we put in some restaurants, some coffee shops, uh, some clubs or bars or restaurants, these sorts of things? So they did. Uh, and in fact, the law actually expanded. The common law was originally just really finance and business focused. It actually expanded uh, to become more family law as well to accommodate these changes. And so we think what's happened with DISC is it's sort of backward integrated 
into what we would call an international city. What is what is a zone where you do business and live and meet your friends for dinner and you know do everything else that it means to be a human other than a city? It's it's just that it's a city, uh, and so we think really that's the model. And and if there's one lesson to learn uh, from DIFC, it's maybe start with that model from the beginning and choose a bit larger uh, plot of land so you have room to grow into it and more more amenities that you can accommodate a, a larger population. Yeah, on a smaller scale, I can I can definitely you know, not, not feel their pain, but relate to them. You know, we, we, we came out of in eco villages, creating these communities that we do kind of from the other direction, right? We created nice, beautiful places for people to live either on the beach or in the highlands or wherever, and then realized, well, you, people need stuff to do too, right? So, you know, it, it was kind of coming out from the opposite. And so we, you know, create restaurants, music studios, workshops, you know, schools, clinics, all sorts of things within the community to basically build a small town. So, Come, coming at it from both directions. And a lot of people do work in the, in our communities because, you know, especially like I said earlier, if you can do it tax-free because say you're an architect or something and you're designing homes here in Veritas in Panama for somebody in the U.S., well, you don't pay any taxes on that. So that's a huge improvement. Yep. So, you know, it's interesting, but I guess, you know, which kind of brings us together to you and I have, have you know, I, I think I can talk a little bit openly at least about one of the countries, which is Ecuador. My my wife is from there and my wife's father, you know, is uh, way well connected in the country. And we were able to get into some really interesting meetings there with the government talking about, you know, they just have a new president, Daniel Naboa. He's very popular, kind of a, almost similar in some ways to Bukele and El Salvador, making big changes in a capitalist way and, and making the country much more attractive for invents, investment. And, you know, we're obviously working on them to, to create an international city. and. And I guess next month, you and I have a bit of a whirlwind tour of numerous countries in Latin America to talk to them about the same sort of thing. I mean, whoever could be, I, I mean, I, it's hard to explain to these countries, like, if you have the opportunity to create Singapore, why aren't you? Like, I, I think maybe we can talk a little bit about the challenges. Like, we're going to do this tour and we know what challenges we're going to run into, right? We know that no country especially with the, you know, some of these countries having, you know, socialist backgrounds and they've, they've turned the corner and, you know, the world's kind of flipping right now with the Western world going socialist and these countries going capitalist. But, you know, the, they've had a lot of history of issues. So it's very difficult for them to give up any kind of what they perceive at least as sovereignty. And, you know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that's probably the biggest challenge that you at Tipolis and, you know, me helping you guys out with what I can as, as we've we've run into it's like everybody thinks it's a great idea but then like okay how do we how do we get, kind of get away with this because what if our people you know our citizens go hey hey you can't give this kind of autonomy to another group altogether like to create their own country within our country so how do you know how do you see that challenge playing out and you know how, how do we get past that yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, that is a big challenge. Um, you know, it's always a sensitive topic. And this is why we we very much stick to the word autonomy, because it is truthfully what we want. We don't want to control how the country operates. We don't want to control how it relates to other states. We want to have the ability to make our own rules within this defined community that people have to voluntarily opt into. If you don't want to be a part of it, by all means, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and so that's really an emphasis of, of ours. I, the other interesting aspect to this is, I mean, you're definitely right. This is a challenge that we face uh, in, in just about every country that we go to. What's interesting is that after the DIFC was created, we've heard from probably at 25 to 30 countries that have said something similar to, I really wish we were there in about 2002 or 2003, when you guys were thinking about setting up the DIFC, we would have done that and it would have worked so well here. Yeah. But the truth is, that's not true at all. <laughs> that's it, it took an, a huge act of courage. It took someone with a backbone willing to stand up uh, and, and try to advocate for something. And it was not a guaranteed success. That's the truth. It was not a guaranteed success. And it wasn't a success for a couple of years. It took a little bit of time to gain uh, traction. And so I think it's really important uh, that, that we think about throwing the ball 
to where we want the receiver to catch it, you know, to, to make the analogy towards American football yeah. uh, or, or actually in, in European football as well. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I think that the point is that, you know, the DIFC was, was visionary at the time. And so what do you have to do now? You can't just do what's already been done, you know, the, to make it even more explicit, creating world special economic zone 6002 does not change anything. Right. You have to do something beyond. And so that's really our argument. Uh, and, and, you know, I think importantly related to the sovereignty, we are big advocates that actually it takes an act of sovereignty to create one of these sorts of things. And you think about Dubai, they were able to do it. They have an absolute monarch at the helm. He absolutely controls everything. And yet he had the courage to be able to do this. If he can stomach this level of autonomy, I think it's possible in other countries. It doesn't mean every country is ripe for it. It doesn't mean all places will work out and there will be these sorts of cries, of course. Uh, but I, I think we'll get there. And you know, the, the final thing I would add is that the total amount of countries that are interested in this topic just makes me think at some point, one of them goes, and when one of them goes, the rest of them are gonna go too, because it, they all have to do it to keep up uh, in yeah, terms of the best. Exactly. Part. Well, and I guess the counter to the sovereignty argument, the, the negative of or fear of giving away sovereignty is you also are bringing in a ton of investment in which right. the government and the existing country gets a, a bunch of that, right? It's not like it all stays within the international city, you know, not only indirectly by people walking around and spending money and, you know, going other places in the country, but, but directly through, you know, some kind of agreement with the government. Right. And I, and I think, you know, I think some of the governments maybe look at the Dubai example a bit like people look at Bitcoin these days, right? It's like, oh, I should have got in early, right? And I, I still think it's early. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of yep. Bitcoin and other some other cryptos. And, and you know, I, I'm still a buyer. So if I was in charge, I would be creating these, these cities knowing that, like you said, you make it a little bit further advanced than the, the previous examples have been. And then all, all of a sudden you're attracting all sorts of investment into the into the international city and it, it you know it just it it just makes a lot of sense to me and and i you know I, I think one of the you know i'm not trying to bring up challenges but i think one of the reasons we haven't been successful yet at getting this to happen in latin america is that like when in, with any politician they're risk adverse right? and you know when you have you know in the u.s whatever canada various other countries you have generally four-year terms in the countries down here, they usually have five-year presidential terms, and so the guy is in in that in the president and 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 the other people in the, in power are thinking, well, if this is a long-term solution, what if I'm not in power when it succeeds eight years from now or something, and you know that next guy is getting all the credit for something I took all the risk on. So th there's a lot of that. I mean, a lot of that is in general in these countries of kind of like, well, I've got five years to make hay. And and I'm probably not going to get reelected, so it, you know there's not a there's not a, t a ton of multiple term governments. So you sure. know there's there's all those challenges, but it would be a it would be a game changer for this area. Like yep. I mean I can and whether it's Panama or Ecuador or you know in Argentina with Millet or in Salvador with Bukele, one of these guys is going to make that choice. Yep, and they're going to be light years ahead of the other countries. I mean, you, you look at Panama City development, that was totally based on, you know, choice that was made. You know, you compare that to, you know, uh, the, the cities in Honduras or Nicaragua, even San Jose and Costa Rica, none of them are, are developed like Panama City is and have the, you know, infrastructure. So it, it just takes that one brave person <laughs> yep. to, to make that call and, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic with you too, is that, you know, we're going to see that in the, in the next few years. And, you know, I know you and, and I and Titus and Mikkel Thorup and others in our kind of our, our group that's trying to make this happen is, you know, we're doing our best to make it happen. We're going to keep trying and not give up. So yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see that first one happen though. Obviously from my standpoint, I'd like to be involved in the, the development of the, of the city, because that's kind of our specialty. And, creating residential zones within within these beautiful cities that we can create. And like you said, it just takes that first one to, mm -hmm. to trigger. Absolutely. Well, I think I think you hit on a couple of very important points. Uh, the first, 
I mean, we're we're not just talking about a massive level of investment. I mean, we're we're talking about tens of billions of dollars over the 20, 25, 30 year life cycle of this. This is a, a just a, a really a huge amount of capital that's being put into something. And like you said, the investment is obviously into much of the international city itself, but a lot of this is general infrastructure type spending that other people also get to enjoy when they walk on a nice, you know, boardwalk and have a, a a nice meal at a restaurant and a marina built in the international city. It's not like an enclave uh, where, where no one else can go, you know, so there are benefits. There are benefits in terms of, you know, connectivity and road development uh, as well as actual financial upside, like you said. And we're specifically within this investment talking about investment that would not otherwise come. So it's it's not like it's taking the place of other foreign direct investment. This is literally investment that would not come to your country, save for this project. So it's really a huge upside to keep in mind. And I think you're right. I mean, the, the other challenge is, is absolutely that it is a long time for one of these projects to be successful. I mean, the Dubai case, it's, uh, what is it? It's about 20 21 years since they established it. Now it's obviously a success, but if you checked with them two, three years after, they weren't so sure. Uh, and so that is a challenge. Um, you know, that said, I think it does take someone really with uh, really with some character and some backbone to stand up and do it. And, and we do have some of those examples uh, in Latin America. And finally, you know, it takes someone who for La- it wants to do the right thing for their people. You know, what, yeah. regardless of the impact on them personally. Uh, and so in that case, you know, it does help if it's someone that's like independently wealthy and wants to do what's right for their country. Um, it, you know, the final thing I would say on that topic is, you know, I don't know if Bukele and his family are independently wealthy or not, but he's shown that taking really radical solutions but doing it because you want to do the right thing for your country, you want to get rid of the crime, you want to have uh, be less reliant on the U.S. and uh, the IMF for loans and bailouts and these sorts of things. These these were really uh, radical reforms that, that Bukele brought, you know, brought in. And look at his his success now. I mean, he's what eighty five percent approved. I think there's room still to go in Salvador, but he shows that by making these big decisions, you know, your best bet for getting getting reelected is is it might be better uh, to to do nothing than to do really bad things. But to to just because they're they're sort of radical reforms doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. If you have the right PR and you have the right marketing around it, and you explain why it's good for the people, I think radical reforms can. Uh, can be quite helpful. So I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get there once. And once we do, it'll become normalized and, uh, and people will need to follow suit. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm especially encouraged because people like Bukele and Naboa exist, right? Like if you look at Bukele, like you were just saying in, in president of El Salvador, if people don't know, look into it. It's a remarkable turnaround. That country went from, I believe the second most dangerous country in the world next to Rwanda or something like that in Africa. And to it's, I believe right now is the first or in, in first place, the safest country in Latin America or in, in all. Well, I think it's almost tied with Canada right now. And Canada is going the wrong direction, it's getting much less safe, whereas, you know, El Salvador continues to become more safe. And and that you feel it on the street. I mean, I've been there many times in the last years and talked to people and they're like, yeah, it's awesome. I can just walk down the sidewalk talking on my cell phone and it's not getting grabbed into my hand anymore. And but for Bukele to do that, he had to put drug dealers and gang members in jail, a lot of them. And that, you know, that was their center. And, and you know, risk his life, absolutely, every moment of every day. And then, you know, Nabo is doing the same thing and cleaning up Ecuador. It was going, Ecuador is a beautiful country, but it was going the wrong direction. And he's doing exactly the, you know, the playbook of Bukele. Both those guys are risking their lives. And the only reason they could be doing that is because they do want to improve the country and make it better for the people the citizens of the country. So that that's what I find encouraging is that these guys might actually, you know, guys like them, there's other countries down here too that are going in that direction. They're seeing the success and the amount of investment in, in Salvador. I mean, I was, you know, I, I went to Salvador when they announced Bitcoin as a currency, um, but I've been there many times before that. And, I, you know, we'd walk down the beach in El Zante or whatever, and there'd be a, a beachfront home for 
$35,000 or something like that. And then when they announced Bitcoin and then the crime started plummeting, now that same home would be like $350,000, $400,000, right? And it's still going up. But that enormous investment into the country, tongue, like the airports, terribly busy. <laughs> it used to be just me walking around in there when I was there. Yep. So, you know, it, it, it's really encouraging. Like I said, the, the countries down here are really switching to more about, you know, capitalism. We've seen, they've learned from history. It doesn't seem like the Western world up, you know, up north has, but that, you know, socialism doesn't work. Millions of people died on that experiment. And, and now that they're switching, I think they're seeing the benefits. And so I'm, I am encouraged that we're going to get one of these international cities going, and then it'll be a beacon for every other country down here to want one as well. Absolutely. And, and Patrick, you're, you're hinting at it, but let me make uh, very clear the, the, one extra benefit of one of these cities is the permanency of it. It is no shock to many people. The radical left-right politics that exists in much of Latin America exists in uh, in the United States in particular as well. If party A did it, then party B hates it and vice versa. And that is a challenge. It's a challenge for setting one of these up. But what does it do when we actually do set one up? Well, consider the case of El Salvador, for example. Bukele has been in power for, what, five years? He was just reelected. He's got another four and a half or so years to go. And that's great. That's 10 years. That's really wonderful. And there's a lot of great things that can be done. And as Patrick was just identifying, have been done. We expect, you know, the similar sort of result for the next four and a half years. But what happens after that? It's very well possible that a Bukele brother or a protege or someone like that is elected. It's also very plausible that someone that's a sort of socialist leaning, uh, you know, fighter for the people, or supposedly, that's what they say, uh, gets reelected and tries to undo many of the reforms. And the problem with democracy is that you can undo many of the reforms if you get enough popular support. International cities, on the other hand, uh, it's possible to, to stymie them and challenge them to some degree, but they offer a level of permanence that's not seen in almost any other reform. These are uh, if possible, anchored in constitutional changes, uh, if not through uh, legislation and then uh, international uh, contracts that are signed you know, with dispute resolution and, and investor protection uh, outside of that host nation. And so what we've seen in the case of Honduras, actually, where they have reneged on their deal, uh, is that the government of Honduras is being sued in an arbitration court in Washington, D.C. for $11 billion. This suit itself uh, hasn't been resolved yet, but what has it done? It's protected the Zedes, uh, which is what the, the term for the zones in Honduras, uh, from being destroyed. There has been backroom pressure, I would suggest, on the Zedes, but there hasn't been any expropriation of land. They haven't even repealed, uh, and well, they've repealed, but then they didn't ratify uh, the the actual repeal of the ZA law. And the reason why is because the government of Honduras knows, even though they've exited from some of these international treaties since, they were in them at the time that the, the ZAs were set up, uh, and therefore they're, they're still subject to them. And if they expropriate land too egregiously, they will lose that lawsuit. I don't necessarily claim for a full $11 billion or anything like that, but it would be material enough to very much hurt uh, the, the country of Honduras and unfortunately the people, but, uh, but, but, but that's really the best way to, to make sure a government uh, stays in line. Yeah. And that's one of the strengths. I think the, the, maybe the biggest strength of the international cities is that consistency. If you have a 99 year contract, at least, you know, you've got that time and the, the politics can go up and down like this, changing parties all the way along, like, like they tend to do. Yep. And, but, but, you know, it's, it's like a contract. You can't unravel that. And, you know, the, the international city gets to remain successful. And, you know, it's sad that, the you know, some of these, well, I'll be blunt, some of the socialist um, governments try to unravel them, you know, by, uh, you know, playing to the to people's fears. Right. And, and it, what, it, it really hurts them. I mean, like if you look at the one in Roatan there in Honduras, Prospero, they, they, you know, they've created a lot of jobs. They brought a lot of investment into the into that country, into that area. A lot of local people are working for them. I've been there many times like you have, right? There's a lot of locals working there. And those locals don't want Prosper to get blown out of the water like that. So, you know, it's, you know, some 
sometimes it's just it's 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 just unfortunate. Fortunately for them, like you said, they you know they had that in the in the law and and are are virtually protected. And so you know the international city is becoming you know becomes more of a stable place than any country really right. you know because I mean right now I'm looking at the U.S. and I mean you know put dating this podcast a little bit but it was just this last weekend where somebody shot at Trump and right if if he had been killed I'm not sure you wouldn't have somewhat of a civil war on your hands in the, in the country right I mean it, who knows what the outcome could have been because there's a lot of annoyed people and you know and then you have Endless printing of money, which is just not sustainable. So, you know, banks are going to collapse. There's going to be an issue at some point. It's just who knows when. The stock markets run up enormously for no apparent reason. So there's all these things that, you know, makes the empire of the U.S. not really, you know, built on sand to some degree. So, you know, if I'm, I, we have a lot of people that are moving to our Veritas Village communities for that reason, right? It's, you know, they want a freedom oriented place. They want a self-sustainable place. that's not reliant on governments or big corporations, but they're also very afraid of their money disappearing in banks in the U S or Canada or wherever. And, you know, parts of Europe as well. And then all these things are going on. So, you know, if, you know, that when we do finally get the, the, uh, an international city that, you know, it doesn't really get much safer than that because you'll have your institutions within the, the city, working in a, you know, a much more protected way. Absolutely. Well, and I would even add beyond that, yeah, I, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and let's give kudos where it's due. Much of Latin America doesn't deal with the same woke level of stuff that we face in, in Canada and the U.S. And in an international city likely wouldn't either, because there's not these minority parties that we, that, that we all need to cater to. You know, yeah. if you don't like the way we do it here, don't move here. That's the answer. And if you are a problem uh for us then then you won't be allowed to live in the international city and i don't it's not really meant to be a big threat because you know the the basically we want average people you don't have to be ideologically aligned with you know patrick and myself you just have to not create problems for you know us as the developer and the the owner and operator of the city and for your neighbors which is yeah. you know you know what we used to call you know common uh, you know neighborly courtesy, but we've lost that, and so we need to recreate it. And, and international cities is one good way to do that. So it's another um, it's a way to escape from the the craziness uh, that that exists in the U.S. and, and Canada in terms of uh, you know woke stuff and promoting things on your children that you're uh, you know unaware of or don't get a say in or they'll take them away. <laughs> If they get found yeah. out, all this I mean, stuff. That, that is one of the beauties of Latin America. And, and one of the reasons I love living here is that the, the culture here just doesn't allow that to happen. When the government or the school is trying to take over brainwashing and indoctrinating your children, they just go, no, then then I'm just pulling my kid out of school and he's going to learn at home. Yep. And so so that the culture is very family protective. And, and that, you know, that that's a great thing. Absolutely. I'm sure we could talk about this forever, Alex, but. Uh, you know, you, you and I will talk about it a lot over the next month when we're traveling around. And I guess I'll see you here in Panama in the next couple of weeks. Yep. And uh, looking forward to that trip. And uh, I really appreciate you being on the podcast here. And and well, thanks. We'll make sure to have you on every once in a while for updates. Maybe we'll do another one in, in a couple of months after we've made our our sojourn and, and see we'll see what happens and if there's things to update. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me, Patrick, and I'd be happy to come back anytime. Looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Awesome. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, everybody, for watching. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.